everyone. I'm Chris Chataway. I'm the Dean of St George's Cathedral, the Dean of this Cathedral, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you this morning, and uh, especially to our visitors or people here for the first time, welcome, and please join us for refreshments after, the, uh, after this service in the Upper Burt Memorial Hall, or um, if you can't say for refreshments, please make yourself known to us, um, to the clergy at the door before you leave. Just a few notes and reminders uh, for you. Firstly, on the, in two weeks' time, we've got our big cathedral lunch uh, approaching, and we're looking for people who's going, who are going to volunteer to provide some of the food, to, to bring some of the food. And there's a list at the back of the cathedral. We'd love you to uh, sign up and uh, say, uh, tell us what you might uh, bring, uh, or have a look at the list before you go. Also, this week we have the, um, uh, today we have a uh, meeting for our stewards, our training for our stewards, and uh, look forward to catching up with you all then. You'll also see a notice for, uh, that we're open, uh, we're looking for some, uh, to increase the size of our steward, stewarding group. And uh, if you're inter interested in becoming a steward, you might come today to the training or at least speak to Eugene or one of the stewards and uh, to express your interest. And finally, uh, this, uh, on, on this Wednesday, on the, um, we're having a, um, uh, the Centre for Spirituality is having a session on Will Our Children Have Faith, Church Schools and Christian Formation? The Reverend Canon Linda Pilton, one of our uh, members of chapter, who's uh, just finished as a chaplain at Perth College and she'll be speaking. I know that's a topic that greatly interests parents and, uh, and grandparents and, and, and really anyone with an interest in how the faith is communicated to a young generation. I encourage you to come. If you could book, there is a email or a phone number uh, to allow you to book for that session, which is this Wednesday um, from 9.30 onwards. Welcome.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nyala Kadich Nunga Mort Kayen Kadak Nija Buja. We acknowledge the Nunga people as the original custodians of this land. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been offered for us. Therefore, we come to celebrate the festival. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith with a sincere and a true heart. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this world alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. Almighty God, who has promised forgiveness to all who turn to him in faith, pardon you and set you free from all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through jesus christ our lord amen Almighty God, whose Son Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life of all who put their trust in him, raise us, we pray, from the death of sin to the life of righteousness, that we may ever seek the things which are above, where he reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, 
one God now and forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Hear the word of the Lord. Behold how good and how lovely it is when families live together in unity. It is like a dew of Hermon, like the dew that falls upon the hill of Zion. reading from the first letter of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that we have seen and heard so that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Hear the word of the Lord.
The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the living God, who is life and bread and breath. Please be seated. The internet platform that was once called Twitter is not really a pleasant place to spend much time. I nevertheless spent a few minutes looking at some of the responses to an ABC report that said that a great many Australians went to church at Easter. Now, the thrust of the responses on Twitter, or oh, sorry, this thing that was once called Twitter, was that these reports in the ABC weren't really true. 
Nobody saw these four churches. And if churches had people in them, mostly they were there for the chocolate anyway. Because one thing that these responses seemed to have in common was that, uh, that, was that they thought that this was all a terrible exaggeration, that the ABC had somehow made all of this up. Because they'd only seen empty churches, these commentators. And these empty churches that they had seen confirmed their view that most Australians weren't terribly interested in religion. And not only were they not terribly interested in religion, they were perfectly right not to be terribly interested in religion. Faith, after all, said these commentators, is a load of nonsense. It can't be proved. Generally, it's the product of an inadequate intellect or perhaps a, a smothering cultural heritage. Nobody seemed to express a thought that the lived experience of the many people who did turn up, and many people did turn up, the fact that they preferred to look past preferring their own facts, might, that fact that these people turned up might challenge their, let me say, rather smug and patronising view of the world. In other words, these posters had no doubt as to their rightness and our essential wrongness. Yet today's gospel invites us to think very deeply about doubt, about what doubt does and about why doubt is important. It also shows us the proper limits of doubt. Now the reading, the gospel reading, is in two parts. In the first part, the disciples are sheltering in a house. All of the doors are locked because they are afraid. Mary Magdalene has been to tell them that Jesus had risen from the dead. But the disciples are still in hiding, not really believing her, afraid that the temple police would come for them next. That is all bar one of the disciples. Thomas wasn't there. Perhaps he'd gone with Mary to see for himself. Perhaps he dared hope that Jesus was alive again and he was seeking him. Certainly Mary's story had made him bold enough to leave that little haven of the house and go abroad in the city. So he wasn't there that evening when Jesus turned up, coming through locked doors, showing himself to the disciples, breathing the Holy Spirit upon them. Thomas missed out. And perhaps he missed out because he took what Mary had said far more seriously than his fellows, and certainly because he was a great deal braver than those who were sheltering behind locked doors. So when he did finally get back and heard the story, he was, let's just say, more than a little miffed. I'm tempted to think that Thomas envied the disciples their experience and was angered to think that he had not been there to share it. A thing that contemporary culture labels in one of those wonderful neologisms, FOMO, the fear of missing out. But I think that it was genuinely so that he was not sure. That was his doubt. He didn't take them seriously. Prove it to me, he basically said. I won't believe it until I see it for myself, brackets, like you have done, close brackets. I can understand his scepticism. He was the one disciple who had dared to think that he might believe. And he was the one disciple who had not seen Jesus. He was the one who might be entitled to think that he had earned the right to see Jesus. And instead, 
Jesus had come to that bunch of pusillanimous scaredy cats hiding behind the locked doors of a Jerusalem house. Right there is the heart of his scepticism. He had earned the right to see Jesus and he hadn't seen him. And at this point, the mind can do funny things. It can catastrophize. It's another wonderful neologism. It can catastrophize, making up worst case scenarios in which all of the other disciples are lying and mocking Thomas. Now, Thomas at this point could either walk away in disgust at this pathetic leg pull and have nothing more to do with them, or he can do what he did confront them, test the story. If Jesus had turned up once, he could turn up again. And Jesus did turn up, answering all of Thomas's doubts. And Thomas's response is really important. It is the point of John's whole narrative here. Jesus meets Thomas's challenge directly. He confronts Thomas. He says, touch my wounds. Put your finger here. Some of the depictions of this moment in art have Thomas doing just that. There's a very famous Caravaggio painting which has Thomas digging a rather grubby finger into the wound in Jesus' side. But in fact, if you look at the text of John's narrative, that's not what happens. Thomas doesn't touch the wounds, doesn't stick his finger in the side. Rather, he simply says, my Lord and my God. Thomas's doubt and his scepticism have vanished. They have not been replaced by something as simple as certain knowledge. That is the Thomas of Caravaggio's painting, who might be saying, oh yes, 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 it's you all right. I was wrong to doubt. No, it goes much further than this. The Thomas of John's Gospel hears Jesus say two important words. In the injunction that follows, John puts two words in Jesus' mouth juxtaposed against each other. You'll forgive me for lapsing into Greek for a moment. They are apistos, generally translated as doubt, and is the negative for pistos, which is the other word, doubt, faith. But the word can also not be translated not doubt, but faithlessness, or one without faith. And Jesus' words are better translated Do not be faithless, but faithful. This is not about the intellectual proof of a claim. It is not about belief that something is true, that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It's not like that. It is about belief in, trust in, life in. It is about Thomas's being with Jesus. Thomas knows this. And so his immediate response is, my Lord and my God. This is a big shift. And it provides the model for how to doubt, how to respond to evidence. Thomas's suspicion is not a bad thing. Doubt is not denial. And it invites the testing that occurs. But then Thomas responds honestly to that testing and all of its implications. He does not deny the reality of his experience so as to maintain his suspicion. He allows instead the response to his doubt to sweep through him so that his faithlessness becomes faithfulness. This is the experience of conversion. Thomas embraces the change and all that means for the rest of his life. Now our own community has had its Thomas moments. 
In the awful COVID years, conspiracies abounded and suspicion seemed far too often to trump science. Both before and since those years in the same way, suspicion has trumped the science on climate change and in fact justified itself by developing a whole new set of facts. Indeed, we are now in a world of alternative facts where we can choose whatever reality we like and assert it free of any doubt. Proper doubt has given way to cheap and nasty certainties. And believe me, there is nothing more terrifying in this world than a person, whether in human relationships or in politics or in business or in religion, who never suffers a moment's doubt, never questions themselves, but clings to whatever purpose they have with a deep and ruthless certainty. The story of Thomas in John's Gospel is a model of doubt and resolution. Doubt is a good thing. All of us doubt from time to time perhaps more often than we would care to admit. Doubt can hone our faith, fertilize it, make it grow in quantity and quality as it did with Thomas. Doubt tests claims. It makes us think and pray and throw ourselves upon the love and mercy of the Spirit of God. And its resolution brings us, as it brought Thomas, deeper and deeper into our relationship, into our own being with our risen Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us together affirm the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. You have delivered us from the darkness of death through your beloved Son, in him, light has conquered darkness. Life has triumphed over death. He has breathed into us your life-giving spirit. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Lord, we give you thanks for the light of the gospel and that it shines in our hearts. We rejoice in the resurrection and in your saving power. 
We remember all who are struggling with their faith, those who doubt, and any who sit in darkness or who live in fear. We bring to mind all who have fallen away from the faith, especially any known to us. And we pray especially for Kay, our Archbishop. Lord God, you are light. We remember our peoples and nations who feel drained and lack energy. We ask your blessing upon all who suffer from poverty or oppression. We pray for any who are separated from their loved ones and their homes. We remember all who are in prison. We hold in the light of Christ our fragile hope for peace in Gaza and across the Holy Land. Lord God, you are light. We give thanks that you appeared in an ordinary home, O Christ. We ask that your presence and your peace may be known in our homes and among our loved ones. We bring before you, before you homes where faith is mocked or persecuted and pray for all who are struggling to remain faithful. Lord God, you are light. We think of all who are struggling with life, homes where there is tension or lack of peace, people who are ill and are afraid of the future, and all who are lonely or facing a time of crisis. May we all know your presence and your peace. Especially we pray for those who have asked for our prayers. Percy, Alex, Raika, Frank, Alma, Ellen, Patricia, Mel, John, Catherine, Princess of Wales, Kerry Lee, Mark, and Charles III. Lord God, you are light. Amen. Father, we give, we give you thanks for the new life that you offer us in your Son. For you offer, you offer us eternal life. We come to you with confidence and pray for friends and loved ones departed. May they know the fullness of joy in your presence and in eternal life. We give thanks for the recently departed, including Arthur Mesa, and we remember those whose yes mind falls at this time. Kenneth Haley, priest, Bob Meha, Joe Leinster McKay, and Tina Crins. Almighty God, you have promised to hear our prayers. Grant that what we have asked in faith, we may by your grace receive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All glory and honor be yours always and everywhere. Mighty Creator, ever-living God, we give you thanks and praise for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by the power of your Spirit was born of Mary and lived as one of us. By his death on the cross, he offered the one true sacrifice for sin, and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. And now we give you thanks that you raised him to life triumphant and exalted him in glory. By his victory over death, the reign of sin is ended. A new day has dawned, a broken world is restored, and we are made whole once more. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Merciful God, we thank you for these gifts of your creation, this bread and wine, and we pray that by your word and Holy Spirit, we who eat and drink them may be partakers of Christ's body and blood. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and when he had given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you, do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup, and again giving thanks he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore we do as our Saviour has commanded, proclaiming his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming again, we celebrate with this bread and this cup, his one perfect and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. us by your Holy Spirit, unite us in the body of your Son, and bring us with all your people into the joy of your eternal kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord, with whom and in whom, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, Father, in songs of never-ending praise.
As our Saviour Christ has taught us, we are confident to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. gift of God for the people of God, come let us take this holy sacrament of the body and blood of Christ in remembrance that he died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, giver of life, in the breaking of the bread we know the risen Lord. May we who celebrate this holy feast walk in his risen light and bring new life to all creation. Father, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia.